Hallelujah. This happens to be uh, Parashat Tetzave, which just so happens is my parasha. This is the parasha that Hashem saw fit to allow me to come into the world. And uh, during the week that I was born, this is the parasha. And it's fitting because it begins, you shall command. And so I think that's a life story. Just kidding. Turn in your, turn in your Bibles to the book of Shemot. Amen. Parasha Tetzave actually begins at Exodus 27, in the chapter, the latter part of Exodus 27, where it begins, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning. It begins talking about the menorah, which is, which is interesting, but then it continues, and the, the remainder of the parasha is about garments for the priesthood. So we're going to be talking about the oil, the lamp, and the garments this morning. The garments of glory and splendor. Let's ask the Father to reveal things to us this morning as we dive into His divine Word. So Hashem, we thank You, Father, that You brought us to this place of time, that You have blessed us with the opportunity to be here amongst our brethren, our friends, our relatives. Father, we pray this morning in Yeshua's name as we dive into your word that it would be like diving into an ocean of blessing and that you would cause your anointing to just fill us, open our minds and open our hearts that we would leave here transformed by your glory in Yeshua's name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I first want to begin by talking about a, an, an overarching truth, if I may. And that is that the tabernacle, of course, prefigures what would become the temple. The tabernacle and the temple, uh, one might think that the temple would be um, perhaps grander or more important than the tabernacle, but not, not really so. The temple was man's attempt and a righteous attempt, and I'm not diminishing that, but the temple was a man's attempt to glorify and beautify the tabernacle. And so Hashem accepted it, and, and yet the tabernacle has more glory, even though it is a tent, so to speak. Now, it's a tent, but it's a multi-million dollar tent. If you actually do the math, and we have before, about the tabernacle, if you, can, if you compute just the gold and just the silver and just the copper and the precious stones in the modern day uh, values, you start to get into the tens of millions of dollars in value. So when somebody says to you, go and why don't, why don't you guys do sacrifices? And you say, well, there's no tabernacle. And they say, well, why don't you build one? Hand them a tithe off offering envelope. <laughs> and say that that's a great idea for the silver foundation alone, we need $5 million. And let them give it. <laughs> Don't tell them about the Jerusalem thing. Just let them give the... Okay? <laughs> but the tabernacle and the temple prefigure what is ultimately the goal, and that is for man to be the temple of the Most High God. And more specifically us as believers collectively to be the temple of God. Now, many people have, are of the assumption, and I, even I myself, uh, in years past when I didn't know better, used to teach that prior to the coming of Messiah, there was a temple or a tabernacle, and that's where God dwelled, but He wanted to dwell in the hearts of men. And so after Messiah come, it became possible for Hashem to do that. And so we used to think that this was an entirely, uh, if I can use the term, Christian uh, concept, this idea of God dwelling in the hearts of men or among men. But in fact, that's not a Christian concept. It's very, very much a Jewish concept. I want you to turn in your Bibles. You can go ahead and hold your place there in Exodus 27. We'll be coming back to this shortly. But turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians Chapter 3 and verse 16. The Apostle Shaul uh, was a Jewish man. And he was a, 
uh, Jewish believer. He was a Pharisee who happened to believe in Yeshua and lived his life as a Jewish man. And he wrote something here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 that is found in Jewish literature uh, of the time. And this is what he says. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit, his Ruach, lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, that means through bad or wrong teaching, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Us as individuals are building stones as you were, as it were, to the corporate temple. When we come into this house, this building is not the temple. We call this a synagogue or in Hebrew it's a Beit Knesset. This is the house of assembly. This is where believers assemble, and when we come together, we make the temple of God. And ultimately, all of what we're talking about here, it has so many different levels of, of meaning and interpretation and purpose, but one of those meanings and interpretation is that God wants to ultimately dwell amongst us and in us. Now, we brought up this topic a little bit on the Wednesday night class as we are talking the last several weeks about Kashrut. And I'm going to make this, uh, I'm going to ask this question because I asked it Wednesday night and I think it's good to ask it to a broader audience. It's a rhetorical question. I don't need to have an answer or, or what have you. But how many of you, if the temple of the Most High God existed today and you were able to go there, how many of you would be, feel absolutely positively comfortable and at ease sacrificing a pig on the altar of the temple. You just would feel absolutely comfortable going in there with a swine and sacrificing it on the altar. I hope the answer is no, because that's what Hasatan did, and he felt comfortable, and if we feel comfortable doing what he does, that's generally not a good sign. Okay? And so I ask this question, if we then are the temple of God... And if His Spirit dwells in us as it did in the temple, the reason that we don't feel comfortable about taking a swine into the temple and sacrificing it is because that's God's house. That's where His Spirit dwells. That's where His glory resides, right? Well, if we are God's house, and if His glory resides in here, then why are we having pork chops? Someone says, well, I love the taste of bacon. No, 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 you don't understand. That was okay, maybe, before you became a believer. Because back then, you weren't the temple of God. But now you are. Amen. And it's not about your taste buds, anyway. That's right. <laughs> right? I am glad that God doesn't ask me my opinion about how to run the world. And you should be glad also. Turn, if you will, to the... Well, first let me read this statement from you from a modern-day Orthodox rabbi. Doesn't yet believe in Yeshua, but this is what he says concerning the temple and the tabernacle. It says, Their physical structure and the service performed in them was ultimately meant to symbolize the sanctuary to be within each human being's body, heart, mind, and soul. When this is accomplished... The purpose of creation will be fulfilled. Now turn in your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. The book of Ephesians chapter 2. The book of Ephesians is perhaps my most favorite book in the apostolic writings. The book of Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. The apostle is talking to Gentile believers here. Formerly Gentile, that is. The word Gentile, uh, at its root meaning in the first century, means outside the body of believers of Hashem. That's what the root meaning means. In second, the second chapter of Ephesians, he's talking about this and he says, Consequently, as a result, in other words, of Mashiach, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, and members of God's household. Now think about this for a second. Remember, the apostle is a Jewish man 
He comes to the table with Jewish ideas, looking at the Word of God with Jewish eyes. And he is saying that those people within Israel who are the remnant and always have been the remnant, who are true believers and true followers of Torah, that they are the household of God. That's what he's saying here. They are the dwelling place of the Most High God. And he's talking to non-Jewish believers who have said that because of what Messiah has done for you, you have been brought in now and made a part of the household of God. He says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Messiah Yeshua himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a, to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So as we're talking about the tabernacle, as we said last week, we've come through the exodus, we've gone through the water, we have come to the bitter water that's been made sweet, we've received and are receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai, and God says, now my ultimate purpose for you is to dwell among you, in fact, I want to dwell in you. There's a point, in fact, where uh, Moshe comes before Hashem, and he says, I just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. And Hashem says, bring 70 elders. And he brings 70 elders. And Yehoshua is with him. He's not one of the elders, but he's with Moshe. And it turns out that apparently 68 elders actually show up to the tent of meeting. And the spirit of the Most High God comes down. Hashem comes down himself and stands before Moshe. And he says, I'm going to take some of the Holy Spirit that's on you, and I'm going to pour it out on them. Yeah. Okay? And so he does that. He pours out the Spirit, and it says the elders begin to prophesy. Yeah. See, I love it when people, see, we got to get outside our paradigm. When God begins to move on somebody, and they began to dance, and they began to really pray or cry, or maybe get a little animated, and everybody's like, well, they should just contain themselves. <laughs> That's just not appropriate. <laughs> Show me in the Bible one instance where the Spirit of God fell on somebody and they contained themselves. <laughs> the Spirit of God fell on Saul and he didn't go, hey man, this feels kind of groovy. <laughs> what, what do you mean, Saul? Oh, I just kind of feel the Spirit of God. Really? Yeah. It's kind of cool. No. You know what he did? He began to dance. The scripture says he danced and began to prophesy. I wonder what that looked like. David came in, spirit of God all over him, dancing in front of the ark, embarrassed his wife. Said, you've really distinguished yourselves in front of the servants today. Guess what? She never had children for the rest of her life and all of her kids that she did have died. David, you know, he wasn't walking to the Lord, you know, walking before the ark going, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. Don't raise my hands or the ushers will kick me out. This is the day that the Lord has made. You know, on that note, and I want to be sensitive about this because I realize that not everybody comes from this background. But there's been times in service when you're praying for somebody and we don't know where people come from when they walk through the door. We don't know what's going on in their lives. They come forward for prayer and sometimes demonic spirits begin to manifest. And guess what? They're not always well behaved, those demon spirits. And it rattles people sometimes because they don't know what's going on. Just understand, please, if you're in this room, that I know exactly what I'm doing when that happens. It's not my first rodeo. But we ought not be surprised that when you pray for people and the Spirit of God is dwelling in you, and you just step forward to pray for somebody, and the demon goes, ah! We shouldn't go, wow, what just happened? I'll tell you what just happened. God in you showed up. And the demon was said, I don't want to be here. 
So we don't see that all, all the time in the United States, and there's lots of different reasons for that. But you go to a third world country where they have demon worship going on all the time, and it's not uncommon. Think about it. When Yeshua walked around, demons screamed. In fact, the, the, the demoniacs around the Sea of Galilee said, screamed out and said, have you come to torment us before our time? He wasn't acting crazy. He's just walking in a room. We should be glad that when we walk in a room, demons flee. That should make us glad. Right? It shouldn't scare us. Why are we scared? I hope that didn't freak you out, but it's just a fact of life. You know? It's a good sign. If you pray for somebody and a demon gets crazy, it's a good sign. You're the temple of the Most High God. Wherever you go, there the kingdom of God is. And as Torah observant believers who are walking in the mitzvah, how much more powerful should we be? Right? Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. The moral of that story is don't be scared. Right? It's okay. It's going to be all right. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. uh, Hebrews, rather, chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. It said, When Messiah came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. The tabernacle, and I want you to understand this, and, and I'm sure that most of you do who are reading through this, these parashot with us, but I, you need to understand that everything in the tabernacle, God showed Moses how to make it. In fact, some people believe, and I'm of this opinion, although I don't want to make a doctrine out of it, but some people believe that when Moses went into the cloud, as he was going up Mount Sinai, as it were, and he walked in the cloud, he kind of stepped into heaven. He stepped into another dimension. And Hashem was walking with him and said, see this cabinet here, this golden altar? I want you to make the golden altar look like that. And see that over there? I want you to make the ark. Mo Moses, I'm, yeah, I know, that's Gabriel. Listen, I want you to make it look like that. That he saw, because the scripture says that God showed him. It didn't say that he told him. It said he showed him. And so the tabernacle is in existence at this very hour in the heavenly realms. And Yeshua, our great high priest, is making intercession for us right there every day. And so he says here that he has entered into the tabernacle not made by human hands, but the one that is an original copy, the original one. That's where Yeshua entered in. And it says in verse 12, he didn't enter in by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of, of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to Elohim, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Did you catch that last part? <laughs> that we've been sprinkled by the blood of Messiah. Now, this is talking about the ashes of the red heifer here. And, it, and without the ashes of the red heifer mixed with the water, the hyssop, the blood, you can't have a temple because nobody could go to it. No thing could be in it without this. And so what the writer of the book of Hebrews is simply saying here is that spiritually speaking, we have been sprinkled and made clean and sanctified and righteous for the purpose of serving him. Now, in our house, we have all kinds of dishes. We have an abundance of dishes, okay? Abundance. <laughs> <laughs> we have dishes for dairy, and we just have dishes for meat. 
We have everyday dishes. We have dishes that we eat on every day, and we have special dishes for Shabbos. And then in the curio cabinet in the other room, we have super duper unique dishes. And those unique dishes are only used for super duper occasions, for high holy days, and for special guests. And so at certain festivals like Pesach, we will set the table and we bring out those crystal uh, stemware glasses where if I break one, I've got to move in with Tom. <laughs> Tom is my city of refuge and I've got to go and hold on to the horns of the altar. Right? Because these glasses have been in our family for a long, long time and anyway, I shudder. I just drink a little wine and put it back. <laughs> Yeah, 100 year old similar. But these are sanctified glasses. And so when I'm getting up on an, any, any given day, I don't go get the stemware and just use it for any old purpose. Maybe put my toothbrush in there and kind of, you know. What are you doing? And I'm brushing my teeth wah, 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 with my 100 year old stemware. I don't do that, do I? No, you know why? Because I'd already be in the Alam Haba. <laughs> Seeing Hashem in the original sanctuary. <laughs> those dishes and those glasses that are in that, that, that curio cabinet have been set apart for special use. And you just don't use them in your way. So why is it if we are vessels of the living God, why do we allow ourselves sometimes just to get down and be used for any old thing? We let any and everything come into our eyes, any and everything come into my ears. We eat anything we want to. And yet we talk about being set apart for special things, but in fact, no, we're not. We dress any old way we want to. Right? Preach it. Amen. What did the priest, how did the priest dress? He just showed up for work just dressed like anything. He came in the house of God. I'm, I was, you know, just looking any old way. I'm, not, I'm just trying to say, we've got to bring ourselves to a higher level. Yeah. We've got to bring ourselves to a higher level. Yeah. Someone, someone says God looks at the heart. That's true. But the outside all, always, always reflect what the inside looks like. Right. So we try to confuse ourselves and trick ourselves and say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. It matters. I just meant all the, this is all spiritual. Yes, but we're a three part being. We're body, soul, and spirit. You can't separate the two. Let's continue reading here. For this reason, Messiah is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promise, the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. There is the reason Messiah came. He didn't come to remove the covenant. He came to set us free from the sins we had committed under it. That's right. Does that make sense? Amen. And now that we are free and clean, we're ready to be used for noble purposes. Amen. Just to carry the, the dishes example just a little bit further. My wife, after we use those dishes, she washes them. She'll put them in the hot water and caution them again and put them back. And that baby is that. They don't get used for just any old thing. It's only for holidays. Everything else is free game. Now let's go back to the book of Exodus. Let us take a look for a moment at this picture of of uh, Tetzave. Exodus chapter 27 and verse 20. It says, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before Hashem from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. This was the only source of light in the tabernacle. And so in the darkness of night, the only source of light that existed was the menorah 
that was burning. And in the Torah, I read it this morning, this first verse, where it says to be kept burning in the NIV. It's, it's actually in the Hebrew, it reads to be an eternal light. Ner tamid, it means the eternal light. It's very interesting, this passage of scripture, because as the rabbis were looking at this, they said the opening words of this parasha says, Veata Tetzave. And according to the gematria, that equals 913, that phrase. Oh, wow. It happens to be the exact same number that equals Bereshit. And if you actually take the word Veata, and if you rearrange the letters, you come up with a word that means passion. So the rabbis looked at this and said, This is very interesting. That when it begins to talk about the service in the temple, the very first thing that's talked about in the parasha is light, the eternal light. 913, which happens to begin, be the same name as Bereshit, 913, equivalent numerically. And what was the first thing? Bereshit is in the beginning. The first thing that we have in the beginning is light. The word or the phrase ner tamid equals 704. The word be Shabbat or in or on the Sabbath equals 704. Shabbat itself is 702. The mirror image of the word Shabbat numerically is the word for light or which is 207. You don't know mirror, you see the reverse. <coughs> and so on the Shabbat, we have additional light, as it were. The light of the Sabbath. That is confirmed by the book of Ezekiel, chapter 46, where it says that on the Sabbath and on the new moons, the prince stands at the gate. How does the word passion play into all of this? Passion is fire. And fire, when properly used, sheds light. Now you can have passion and you can use your fire passion improperly and you're not giving off light. You are burning people out. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> we want to be passionate for Hashem, but we want to be passionate in a sense that gives light as we're shining in front of Him. Many of us have found, about, found out about Torah observance and the relevance of it and we've gone out and we've Instead of being a light, we've been a blowtorch. Let me tell you about the Torah. And we're done. Our friends are there smoking. And we're like, why don't they get it? They can't because of the flames that are shooting. What's the source? What's the fuel of the fire? Oil. Olive oil. What does olive oil represent? It represents the anointing that flows from heaven. When we have the right oil for our fuel, the anointing, then we shine a beautiful light and we draw men by the light of the radiance of God. I want to share, you, share with you a prayer on page six of the the, the sitter that we say in the morning when we wrap to feeling it's on page nine pardon me from your wisdom O supreme God may you imbue me from your understanding give me understanding with your kindness do greatly with me and with your power cut down my foes and rebels and May you pour goodly oil upon the seven arms of the menorah to cause your good to flow to all your creatures. And may you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Now on this topic of oil, how do we get this oil? How do we, how does the Shem cause this pure oil to be made manifest in our lives so that we can shine a beauty in the light of Torah? I want you to turn to the book of Romans Chapter 5. The book of Romans, chapter 5.
I suppose the medication that I am taking to try to clear up my my sinus issue here has made me delirious. I actually thought I wouldn't have enough information today. But we're going to go another hour. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 it was delusional. <laughs> Beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Messiah, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of Elohim. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Ruach HaKodesh, whom he has given us. See, the apostle here says we need to take a positive approach to suffering, to loss, to, to, to uh, trial and tribulation. Because that, I'm going to submit to you, is how God is able to produce pure oil. In fact, if you are taking olives and you want to get the purest, cleanest oil, you don't put them through the normal olive press. There's an actual practice that's called beating the olive. And you take it through a mortar and you have to hand beat it, as it were, hand press it. And it's that, that, that pressure that produces the pure, clear olive oil. So as we're walking through our life and we're saying, man, I've been through some trial and I've been through some tribulation, I submit to you that Hashem is allowing you to be beaten, quote unquote, so that the purest olive oil can be produced from your life. Our choice on whether olive oil comes out or whether it doesn't is based on our response to the trial and the tribulation. Everybody has been through hardship. Everybody, and by the way, there's not always answers for certain things. My wife and I have been through hardship and trial and tribulation. We can't, we still today will look back on those situations and say, why did that happen? I wonder what was the purpose in that? We don't have the answers and we don't pretend to have the answers. But this that we know, thank God, we have taken those trials and tribulations and we, it has made us stronger believers and it made us more committed to the work of Hashem. It's like Kepha, who when the Lord was giving a, a drosh and many of the disciples left him, and many of his followers left him because his drosh was too difficult. And Kepha, he looked at Kepha and he said, will you also leave me? And Kepha looked at him, looked around, and said, where else will we go? You have all truth. So when you reach the end, and you don't know what happened in the answers, you had walk into trial and tribulation, and you don't know why or the what for or what have you, there's only one direction to go, and that's into the arms of Hashem. Because He's the only one who has light and life. Where are you going to go? Into the arms of death and destruction? So we know that God's ultimate purpose for us, His ultimate aim for us is for life. And you may be walking through a situation right now where you don't understand how what you're going through can be for life. But trust me, it is. It is for life. And it's the light of life. Yeshua said, I am the Ne'er Tamid. He's the eternal light. He's the light of the world. He is the light of the world. And the light of the world was referring rabbinically to the menorah that's in the tabernacle. Now quickly, before we close today, I want to run through, if I may, the garments of the priesthood because they're important and I want to at least be able to mention them. Interestingly, that the garments of the high priest consisted of eight garments. The garments of all the other priests consisted of four garments. And it was said that these garments are likened to the fabric 
that Hashem ordained for the tabernacle, that all the fabric of the tabernacle, particularly the walls, were supposed to be joined together so that they would, in the Hebrew, become echad, one. So the tabernacle stands as a unified building, as it were. And the numeric value of echad is 13. Okay, keep that in mind. So you have eight garments of the high priest and four garments of the regular priest, that's 12. And according to tradition, Moses, when he was standing in the office of the priest during the seven days of the inauguration of the temple and the priesthood, that he wore a single white linen robe, 13. So that the garments that we wear point to Ethad. They say, what does this have to do? Because these are the garments of the priest. We're not priests. Yes, but I want you to see today that we are all clothed in spiritual garments. In fact, the apostle said it like this. Don't you know that when you are baptized into Messiah, you are clothed with Messiah? Now today we don't have priests, at least not in the... We do have priests, but they're not currently serving their office because... We don't have a temple. But there are things that we do as believers. We have clothing that is representative of our priestly office. For instance, gentlemen and ladies both, for that matter, wear head, co head coverings. All the priests wore head coverings. In fact, the high priest wore a head covering when he went into the throne of God. Once a year. And he was commanded to do so. I want to give you uh, some passages. We're not going to have time to turn to all of them today. But I want to give you three passages of scripture. Because many people ask about head coverings. Wearing a kippah. Wearing a, another type of head covering or what have you. And wonder about the validity of it. And I just want to point this out to you. As we're looking at these garments spiritually and what have you. Is that never in the scripture will you find anybody coming before Hashem. To be in his presence who's not wearing a head covering. And so let me give you these references. 2 Samuel 15.30. That's 2 Samuel 15.30. Leviticus chapter 16. Zechariah chapter 3. 1 Kings 19.13. And Isaiah 61 and verse 3. Depending on your translation, Isaiah 61 and verse 3 says in some translations, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. Okay? The word beauty in Hebrew is actually a head covering. It's not beauty. It's actually head covering. Okay? So the high priest and the priest wear these garments. So let me walk through them quickly to explain what the significance are. The first garment is the, the breeches, the, the linen breeches that the priest wore. And the purpose of linen breeches was for the sake of modesty. Hashem said, wear these so that I would not see your nakedness and you would be destroyed. And so it teaches us that when we put on our clothing, spiritually and in the natural, they were to dress modestly. We're not trying to attract attention. We can dress nicely and we can dress beautifully, but we dress modestly. Amen? We're not trying to reveal anything to anyone, right? right. Yeah. And we're to wear, they wore a white tunic. The white tunic represents purity. The white tunic represents the purity that we have because white linen always represents righteousness. They wore a white sash for that represents truth because it talks about in the Brit Hadashah that we have the belt of truth upon us. And every priest wore a head covering in the house of God. The head covering is like a crown. It also represents humility when we come before Hashem. Many people that wear head coverings, if you think about a head covering, if people are dressing up or in the military, they wear head coverings because it's regal. Mm -hmm. Every soldier has a special head covering they wear. Mm -hmm. every, every king and queen and prince and princess, they wear crowns upon their head. They have head coverings. It says when we get to the Alam that Hashem himself is going to give us crowns 
and we're going to cast them at his feet. The high priest wore the robe of the ephod, which was made out of solid tefillet. Now, tefillet is an actual color. And tefillet is the blue. It's often called blue in the English, sometimes turquoise. It was supposed to be worn on the zitzit of the Jewish man when he wears his clothing. He's supposed to have the tefillet on the zitzit. And it is specifically tefillet because tefillet represents God's throne. It represents the heavens where he, he is. And so on this robe of the ephod, he had the tekelet. He also had bells and pomegranates on the bottom, which represent the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. And so when we wear tekelet on our tzitzit, we are reminded that we have a role to pray to play in the priesthood. That we have a role. On the ephod also was the breastplate that had all of the stones of the tribes of Israel. And on his shoulders were two stones. And these are very important. Because on one stone it had six names of some tribes. And on the other it had six names of, tri of the other tribes. And every single day when the high priest would go into the meeting house to present offerings to the Lord and stand before him, he had on his shoulder the names of the tribes of Israel. And so he was representing to God the remembrance of the tribes. And on his chest were the stones of the tribes of Israel. And guess what? Our great high priest is wearing that very garment today. Not the copy, but the original. And there are people today that think God is done with Israel. And they're going to get to heaven and Yeshua is going to stand before them with 12 stones and 12 names. And people are going to go, uh oh. <laughs> By the way, it's a good point my wife just made. It says that when we go to the holy city and the Olam Haba, that there's 12 gates, and above each gate is the name of a tribe. Guess what? There's not a tribe for America, or a tribe for Ireland, or a tribe for Russia. You're going to be assigned a tribe. It says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 66, that he's going to take some of the people from the nations and make them Levites. That's what it says. Don't believe me, look it up. It says he's going to take some people from the nations and make them the Levitical tribe. You, people in this room right now, you say, I wasn't born a Jew, but I got here as fast as I can. <laughs> Some of you in this room today who've been grafted in, you might be a Levite, don't even know it. Amen. When we're getting to heaven and they're assigning, they're assigning duty, and by the way, I don't care what my duty is. Kafa's going to be working in the kitchen, I know that. <laughs> I don't care what my duty is. I'm just be happy to be there. But when they're, when they're going through the gate, they might look at Chris and say, Chris, Levi Gate, you're on, you're on watch next week. Amen? Amen. Some of us may be playing instruments who, you may never play an instrument in your life, but you may be assigned to play an instrument on the Levitical worship team. Amen. Amen. Isn't, that be, isn't that exciting? <laughs> Let me tell you something else that's kind of cool. Every day when we get up and we say the Shema twice a day, we're representing... We're being a priestly representative for the nation of Israel. Here's why. The word, the phrase Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad is six words. See, on the, on the, on the nameplate, there's six names and six names. All together, it's 25 letters and 24 letters. Okay? So, when we say Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, that just so happens that it's six words and 25 letters. When we say Baruch Shem Tavod, Galfutu Le'olam Ve'ed, it just so happens it's six words and 24 letters. It's numerically equivalent when we say the Shema. When we stand up as Hashem's representative, we're each acting individually as priests, and we're saying, remember your people. Amen. The high priest wore head covering also. Head coverings, I just... On the high priest's head covering was something unique, though. A golden plate that happened to be secured, I'm sure it's by coincidence, by a shred of tefillet. 
Someone says, why can't we just wear any old blue in our tzitzi? Why does it have to be kosher to kill it? Read your Bible. Everywhere the word blue is used for the temple and clothing, it's always tefillet. So just Walmart writ dye doesn't work because it's not tefillet. See, God is specific and we need to be specific. But on this breastplate, or this head plate rather, is sealed le Adonai, kadosh le Adonai, holy to the Lord. And it says in the apostolic writings that spiritually you've been sealed. And isn't it interesting that when we write tefillin in the morning, when we men get up in the morning, we put on tefillin, and we put the tefillin here, and we wrap here on our arms, and we make this sheen on our hand. We have the, on the box on our head, there's a letter sheen, which represents Shaddai. On our hand is a letter sheen. And we're standing there, it's like the priest who's standing there with his head covering on that says, Kadosh le Adonai. And isn't it interesting that Hasatan, cursed be he, he wants his anti-Messiah to come and put his mark where? On our hand and on our forehead. And when we men stand in, in our homes and make that declaration and make those prayers, we are representing our households. Amen? I want you to know this morning, God has clothed you in righteousness. And as we're, I'm closing with this, by the way, this run through of, of the priestly garments. As we are reading these parsha, we need to be, there's so many levels but we need to understand that this is speaking to us spiritually. The reason we wear ta talit is because it's a priestly garment. We're coming in to his service. And as you go out of this house, this, this place is a place where we come to refresh, to plug in, to sharpen our swords, to polish our shields. And we're going out there to act as his priest. We're going out there to bring his glory in his tabernacle. We're going out there to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. We're going out there to be light and salt to people and bring life to them. And you might be going through something, as I said earlier. I'm being pressed. I'm being crushed. I'm being beaten. And God is saying... I'm bringing out the oil. Because you have to have pure oil in order to have a bright flame. And you can't get that pure oil without crushing and without beating.